What is it that sets some people apart? We're in a race against the Nazis. There are so many struggling filmmakers out there. Everything is about that larger than life experience that we're intending to give the audience at the end of things. And the world will remember this day. Only a few manages to rise to the highest of fame. I got my English degree and I couldn't get into film school and I started just making my own films on 16 millimeter. I wanted it to have bigger possibilities. I wanted to do it in a way that I was excited about. Christopher Nolan is one of them. What was it that made it possible for him to create Oppenheimer, one of the biggest films in history? So what helped him go from a kid making super 8mm films to becoming a star in Hollywood? Nolan started creating cinematic masterpieces at just 7 years old. Armed with his father's super 8mm camera, he brought action figures to life and even recreated a NASA launch footage. From the age of 11, he aspired to be a professional filmmaker. So are you a filmmaker? Then you know how freaking hard it is to become a professional filmmaker. I've been trying for years. I've been to Hollywood. I've sold films to Netflix. I don't consider myself successful. It's freaking hard. In 1995, he decided to flex his creative muscles and make a black and white short film called Larceny. The big hit at the Cambridge Film Festival. But despite early success, he struggled to find support in the British film industry. Sounds familiar? Comment below what your experiences in the industry is like. What struggles have you faced? Unlike Nolan's masterpieces, most documentaries are a rambling of words, leaving no significant cinematic experience for the audience. Too often, documentaries become an information vehicle or a boring life experience rather than an emotional affair to view life differently. I needed to understand how he does it. Action! My preference is to always do things in camera as much as possible. It sets a big challenge for every department to actually bring the reality of a thing there for the actors. What makes him different? Is it his great use of technology? His action-packed filmmaking sequences? What do you think? Comment below. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. It is the storytelling, of course. That's at least what I think. To understand how Oppenheimer came to be, we need to look a little bit more on his passion for filmmaking and where it stems from. What created this unique style and approach to filmmaking, categorized by nonlinear storytelling and complex narratives? He often explores themes of memory, time, identity, and morality in his films. And it allows audiences to experience the story through a more subjective lens as they piece together the narrative alongside with the characters. Despite being highly stylized, Nolan's films have a sense of documentary reality. This is what documentary filmmakers should take to heart. How can you tell stories with the whole cinematic language and not just base your narratives on talking heads? Nolan is a great master at building tension through intricate and multi-layered plots with numerous subplots and twists that keeps audiences engaged and guessing until the end. He often employs mystery or a puzzle structure, encouraging viewers to actively engage with the story and develop their interpretations and solutions themselves. He is known for his ability to take complex subjects and turn them into accessible and engaging stories. This is what it's all about, making the audience immerse themselves into the story. If you take one thing from this video, th this would be it. He first attempted a feature in the mid-90s with a project called Larry Mahoney, 
which was scrapped and never released. At this stage of his career, he had little or no success getting his projects off the ground. But he didn't let that stop him though. In 98, he released his first feature film, Following. So you followed women? I followed anybody. I just wanted to see where they went, what they did. It was supposed to just be completely random. You would never follow the same person twice. That was the most important one. That was the one that I broke first. That's when the trouble started. I was working in the field of corporate videos. I was doing camera work and sound work for media training sessions for companies. And I actually learned a lot doing that kind of video camera work. I learned a lot about going into an environment, using a couple of lights, setting up very fast. You'd figure out how to do something that looked pretty good very quickly. And that was very much the production methodology we transferred over to the film. It was a no-budget film in the, in the true sense. We spent about $6,000 on the entire movie. So it was all myself and Emma and a, and a group of our friends getting together each Saturday to shoot about 15 minutes worth of footage. And we did that for about a year and put the thing together that way. It was a very good learning experience to be able to spread it out over that time. A lot of no-budget filmmakers take exactly the opposite approach and do it really fast and furious to get these people together and say, okay, you have to just do this for three weeks. I wasn't able to do that because we all had to work full time during the week and couldn't really take much time off and that's how I paid for the films the salary from my job so I decided that if I saved up a little bit of money and then we spread out shooting just sort of 15 minutes of footage every week or something like that if I ran out of money I could sort of stop shooting for a couple of weeks and earn a bit more the only thing we spent any money on at all was buying the film stock and processing it you can see how well he masters audience engagement through his puzzle storytelling. Another thing that you can sense when you watch Following is the same dialogue and realness that made The Dark Knight so successful. This is one thing that I think made The Dark Knight so much more believable than other superhero movies. So do you struggle to make your film? I know that feeling too well, but I got your back. In six weeks, I'll teach you the industry secrets that took me over 20 years to learn. And trust me, I'm not talking about how to make a mean cup of coffee on set. I'm talking about the real stuff. How to refine a story and pitch it to major platforms. Go to learndocumentary.com to learn how I can help you make a great film. But don't wait around, because this is only available to a select few around the world. Follow turned his life around. Setting the stage for Nolan's breakout film Memento in 2000. The condition? It's my memory. Amnesia. No, 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 no. It's different from that. This brings us to Oppenheimer. A mind-bending thriller that takes you on a wild ride through the life of Julius Robert Oppenheimer, the genius physicist behind the creation of the atomic bomb. would not be the same. Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. Directed, written and co-produced by Christopher Nolan, Oppenheimer's journey from young prodigy to becoming the mastermind behind the deadliest weapon in history is different. It's not your typical hero's tale. This film digs deep into Oppenheimer's psyche, exploring moral dilemmas and his lasting legacy as the father of the atomic bomb. Tackling this larger than life character on a screen is a challenging feat. Oppenheimer was an equal parts genius, leader and tortured soul. And remember the ethical and moral questions his work raises? It's a fine line to navigate. To truly capture the essence of the Manhattan Project, Nolan spared no effort in recreating the historical events and context surrounding this groundbreaking endeavor. And our imaginings horrify us. But it's not just about the facts. Oppenheimer weaves together the personal drama of Oppenheimer's life with the grand tapestry of history. Prepare for an immersive experience that will challenge your perception of storytelling maybe even bending time and space. This epic narrative boldness is what documentary filmmakers should strive to achieve. You don't need a multi-dollar budget to do that. All you need 
is a passion and a vision that is bold and different. What? Brother told me the story verbally. I Meanwhile, we were driving cross country between Chicago and Los Angeles. And we both decided right away that by far the most interesting way of approaching that concept was subjectively, to tell the story in the first person. When I was in film school, Nolan released his film Memento. I loved it, but it was criticized. A lot of people thought that him telling the story in reverse was just something that he came up with because the story was too boring. The voiceovers in the color sequence and the black and white sequence are very different. And the color sequence is the voice of the mind. It's the first person. It's very much his thoughts as he's thinking them. In the black and white scenes, they sound a bit like interview grabs. You know, a bit like this kind of interview, edited and laid over pictures of him in this room going about his, his life. So I wanted to introduce this almost documentary style element at the beginning of the film to give the audience a little bit of information, objective information about how this guy lives his life and what he thinks, um, and to break up these scenes. The color sequences become a little bit less intensely subjective. I think towards the end of the film, we really start to step outside his head a little bit and start to question some of the things we've been told about this character or some of the things he's told us himself. The black and white scenes, on the other hand, as the movie progresses, they become um, less and less objective. We start to get more and more into his head as he exists in this motel room. Uh, and in fact, then the black and white and the color scenes actually meet towards the end of the movie. What kept Nolan going? Despite not studying film, he's one of the most innovative and talented filmmakers out there. How do you think he's impacted the film industry? Christopher Nolan has a precise and intense writing process that would make even the most disciplined filmmaker quake in the boots. His journey begins with a deep dive into the infinite world of research. This is the, really the culmination of a, of a golden age of physics. It just so happened that uh, uh, Oppenheimer grew up in New York and he was a bit spindly and his father wanted to toughen him up and so he sent him out to New Mexico to uh, ride horses. He would take off on horseback riding trips into the wilds of New Mexico for three or four days at a time with a jar of peanut butter and a bottle of whiskey and uh, must have seemed like a good idea. So he knew this spot and he knew how remote it was and that is why Los Alamos today is where it is. Minus 30 seconds. Finally, after three years work, the atomic experts were ready to test their first bomb. Gathering ideas from history, literature and science like a creative sponge. He then meticulously shapes and sculpts the story, agonizing over every character, twist and turn. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Once the blueprint is complete, Nolan dives into the writing process, crafting multiple drafts until he achieves perfection. No line of dialogue or scene is spared from his watchful eye, as he ensures each element serves a purpose in the grand tapestry of storytelling. But here's the kicker. Nolan doesn't play by the rules of conventional storytelling. He's a master of the unexpected, often throwing non-linear structures and mind-bending techniques into the mix to challenge our cinematic expectations. This dedication and meticulousness are driven by one ultimate goal, to create films that ignite our intellect and touch our hearts. Do Chris's movies, things that when you read a script you normally would think would be visual effects, you know that you're gonna be doing this stuff practically. They had to film the world of quantum physics. Their whole unit was one big science project. I was daily very jealous. It's kind of back to the old days. We did a lot of experimentation. We came up with some very interesting analog methods of how to approach this, all of which was leading to the Trinity test, which had to feel nightmarish and terrifying in a way that computer graphics never really is. 
were able to get into the finished film, to me, is extraordinarily beautiful, but also very frightening. Nolan's process is a glorious symphony of intelligence and innovation, cementing his place as one of the greatest filmmakers of our time. There are valuable lessons to be learned for your documentary endeavors here. We're all here to do the same thing. Chris makes films for theaters, for movie-going audiences. You know, so you want to see that. He devotes hours to extensive research, soaking up historical and cultural context. This ensures an authentic and captivating world for his audience. Documentaries demand the same dedication to research. It sort of makes you gasp. You're right in their experience. This is, I think, a definitive moment in the history of modern filmmaking. With the sound design and the score and the emotionality of it, this is an unforgettable, unmissable experience in a theater. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. We made Oppenheimer on the largest scale possible because the idea is to come and experience this. His story is monumental and epic and extraordinary. It really has to be seen on the big screen to be believed. Every shot, sound, every detail matters. Aspiring documentary filmmakers should take note. Craft your story with care and attention to detail and watch your films become powerful and unforgettable. Who says documentaries have to be conventional? Feel free to bend the rules. Experiment with different techniques and unleash your creative genius. You gotta push the boundaries of storytelling and play with techniques to keep it fresh and exciting by experimenting with new forms. I try to balance the subjective with the objective and give sufficient momentum to those two timelines that they're gonna, there's a feeling of, of uh, confluence at, at the end. You also gotta plan, baby plan. Nolan's meticulous planning and outlining process is legendary. He carefully constructs a detailed structure and maps out every plot, twist and turn. And the result is a tight, coherent narrative that hits all the right notes. Aspiring documentary filmmakers should do the same. So what is it that sets unknown filmmakers apart from the greats? Nolan's early films may not have been a hit out of the park, but he didn't let that stop him. Instead, he embraced failure as an opportunity for growth. Nolan is the king of taking risks. He fearlessly experiments with narrative structures and techniques to keep audiences on the edge of their seats. So try to find your way of doing that. Break free from the ordinary and create something extraordinary. Forget dry facts and stats. Explore the inner struggles and complexities that makes your subjects relatable and unforgettable. And remember to paint with visuals. Prepare to amaze with stunning visuals that tell a story independently. Play with framing, camera movement, and lighting to create visually captivating documentaries that leave a lasting impact and you have to nail the structure. Like Nolan's meticulously crafted narratives, your documentaries need a tight design. Use outlining or storyboarding techniques to ensure seamlessly flow to your documentary and keep your audience engaged from start to finish. If you need help to develop your story to be able to pitch it to networks like Netflix, I can help. I have a program where I help people develop it in six weeks. Check out the link in the description, learndocumentary.com. And if you want to learn more about storytelling, check out this video where I break down how I went from struggling to selling my films by making one change that made it possible to sell to Netflix. And all I needed was to tell a story. <laughs>